we are the place to be because it's my great honor to welcome Dr. Stephen Odaibo. I mispronounced his name earlier and I apologize, Doctor. Um, he's going to be speaking to us about how AI is revolutionizing healthcare in Africa. And just to make sure you're all on your toes, before you get a drink, he's going to test your matrix multiplication. <laughs> so we're watching. That's good. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's such an honor to be here uh, in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, you know, I always say that, I always remind people I was born in Nigeria. I'm a Nigerian citizen. I'm very much African. I'm based out of the U.S., out of Houston, uh, but I'm really delighted to be here, absolutely. So, my, to tell of my talk is how artificial intelligence is revolutionizing healthcare in Africa, okay? And uh, I have, uh, I own this company. Um, the question that I'm gonna ask you guys is, how has artificial intelligence revolutionized healthcare? What do I hear here? Crickets, okay. Silence. But that would be the case anywhere in the world. You'll hear those crickets anywhere in the world. It's early days for artificial intelligence, but we're getting there. Now, if I rephrase the question for you and I say, how is artificial intelligence revolutionizing healthcare in Africa? Now, that's the question to ask, okay? And here's what you're gonna hear, listen. Very nice. There's a groundswell of excitement on the continent. This is the youngest continent on Earth, okay? Median age, how old? Median age of Africa, 19 years old in 2015, UN put out a survey. There's a lot of people that have cut the bug of artificial intelligence, data science. A lot of young people want to learn about this. Africa has leapfrogged in telco. I'm glad that I'm here at the Africa Com, primarily a telco conference, and led the world in things like mobile money. It's an exciting time. Let's hear that beat again. like it. Great. We've got a young continent and we have mobile penetration. This is going to be important in this revolution and it has started. The revolution has started, okay? Um, of the young people in Kenya, for instance, 90% have a mobile phone, all right? So it's the case that, you know, just about every, everybody on our continent can access data and can access uh, mo through mobile technology, and that's only continuing to improve. So this is the infrastructure, this is the groundwork through which um, this revolution has begun, all right? Now, certainly in clinics all around, the country, all around the continent, in every country on the continent, there's this access, all right? So this revolution has begun because we can reach people, and healthcare, the healthcare problem, is primarily a problem of access, okay? Getting the care to the people that need that care, where they need it, when they need it, in a cost-effective manner, all right? Now, another critical part of all of this is the skills that are needed. We need data scientists. That's the number one most in-demand job in the world, is data science, all right? A data scientist in the United States makes a good income. And that's true anywhere in the world. Because of the high demand, you know, you've got companies like Google, Apple, um, Facebook, you name it, they're mopping people up. And so if, if you have a child, tell them to do data science. And there's a lot of buzz on the continent and there are a lot of exciting young entrepreneurs who have started to do their own thing and who have seen the vision of where AI is gonna take healthcare in Africa and help Africa not only catch up, but actually start to lead. And I want to highlight a number of those uh, people uh, today. The first person I want to talk about is this young man right here, Darlington Okogo. He's out of Ghana. 
And Darlington is quite impressive. Quite an impressive young man. He's gathered a good team for himself and is, is growing. And he is uh, tackling the problem, which is the problem that really anybody looking to do AI in this space is looking at. He's tackling the problem of diagnostics, finding the data, training algorithms. He's starting to look at that, and he's taking a committed approach to it. The commitment's what matters. As I said, the revolution has begun, all right? And what's even more impressive is that this is happening right here in Africa, in Ghana. So Darlington Okogo, very impressive young man. Another person that I want to talk about is uh, this young man right here, Dr. Adiola Adishina. He's a pharmacist, a pharmacist who trained, as, uh, in, uh, went to pharmacy school, finished pharmacy school, and then picked up data science in an active way. He's committed himself. He's become a part of the data science Nigeria community, and he's trying to do some impressive work uh, in that area. So these are people, these are the, these are gonna be the revolution that we're looking at. And then this young man right here is a medical student, Paul Ronnie. He's in Ghana as well, and he's taught himself how to program computers. He's an enthusiast in AI and ML, CEO and founder of Sun City Panels AI. There are hundreds and hundreds of people. This is just a sampling of what's going on. Uh, and there's no revolution without people, right? So the people are there, right? The infrastructure is there, and the time is now. What else do we need, okay? So it's looking really good from a revolution standpoint and in terms of what's gonna happen. A number of ingredients are critical for any revolution, for any really major endeavor that anyone's gonna do. You have to have courage, right? So courage is a key part of this. And that's something that I don't think there's too much shortage of that on the face of it in Africa. But at the same time, we have to see that courage is connected to a few other things as well, right? And that, that might be a damper in some ways. And so all different parts of this process have to be recognized. Capability is one thing. I talked about training data scientists. We have to have the right people with the right skill set, all right? And then commitment making a decision to get out there and to get it done. And to say, you know what, I'm gonna drop what I'm doing and I think this is a big enough a problem that I'm going to commit myself, my time, my resources to tackling it. Yes, healthcare is that important. Healthcare, we have food, security, healthcare, they're all up there. And those are the things that have to be addressed for Africa to move forward. There's no other way uh, forward. And then the other thing is capital. Right? Healthcare is, healthcare is interesting. They're cost effective ways of doing things, and you can do things sometimes at a 10x to 20x uh, markdown by being smart and efficient about it, but still, that still gets you to a point where there has to be capital and there has to be support, and that has to be thought about, you know, in its full context. This graph shows you not even, it shows you part of the problem. The problem is actually bigger than this. Uh, this is a graph that the UN put out uh, in 2015 uh, projecting how much shortage of healthcare trained and skilled healthcare providers we're going to have in the world. And I'll tell you firsthand that no country on earth has enough specialists, okay? I'm a retina specialist practicing in the United States, right? And I can tell you for a fact that I lived at the corner of uh, three states right there by my clicker. I lived at the corner of Illinois, Wisconsin, and Iowa, and within a 40-mile radius, right, I was the only retina specialist living there. I can tell you that when I left, they didn't have a retina specialist living in that radius. People would come in, travel in and out to take care of people. People are going blind in America. Can you believe that? Can you conceive of that? So now project that and think about what's happening in a number of our African countries. Healthcare is a big deal. AI is here. There's no way around it, and we really need to accelerate that process to get these things to happen. So the revolution has begun. But your next question is a natural one. What exactly is AI, right? Uh, we have an AI summit going on in tandem with this, but um, it's still really a new phenomenon. Um, I would say AI is really so new. You know, AI didn't really, in terms of as a feasible technological subfield that's really changing the game and really is a business proposition, didn't really come alive until, I would say, about five years ago. 
before five years from now, we didn't see AI in the news. There was no such thing, right? Nobody thought that this was a viable option or a viable alternative, right? Um, the algorithms were there, machine learning algorithm, confidence, et cetera, et cetera. People say it's all because that computers were not powerful enough. The truth, the real truth is that it was hidden in plain sight, right? You don't need a GPU to do AI. You can do it off of your regular CPUs and we're doing that. So you gotta ask yourself, what else are we not seeing? What other revolutionary technologies are right there? And 30 years from now, people will be scratching their heads and say, why didn't they do that 30 years ago? But what is AI? Um, I like to use this example here. Uh, we, so we're in Africa, I like mango, right? Who, how many people like mango? Great, mango, I love it. All right, I grew up in Nigeria. I'll go up in a tree when I was a kid. I'll eat all the mango I could eat before I come down. So I had to use a mango example for you guys. Um, you have, say, a, ye a yellow mango is ripe and a green mango is not ripe. Those are labels. Those are labels that we understand as people, right? We understand ripe, we know that has contextual meaning, right? A ripe mango is a mango that I can eat. Um, a ripe mango is a mango that I can use to make mango juice or a smoothie or whatever else. An unripe mango also has its own utility, but it also has meaning. One of the things that comes to mind is I can't eat that, right? So that's a label and you can do AI, you can sort that, you can train a machine learning algorithm, that's it. You know, really that simple concept generalizes to every single industry. If you're sitting here and you're not uh, here for, you're not particularly in healthcare, if you're in finance or insurance or whatever else, or transportation, it is basically the same problem. It's a problem of sorting, labeling and sorting, and getting um, actionable intelligence out of your data. That is the AI problem, and that is the problem that really generalizes to just about any industry, and that's why AI is gonna take over, all right? So here I'm talking about mangoes, but in my work, I'm a retina specialist. I treat people's retina, I do injections, do laser surgeries and the like, and this is a picture of the retina, all right? So I look at that every day. That's the retina, that's the optic nerve, and this goes right to the brain. It's like a cable, it's like this kind of uh, cable, right? Uh, it goes from the monitor screen into the CPU that does the computing, and that's how we're able to perceive. Visual perception really happens over here. The eyes itself is really just a sensor that accepts the photons, understands where they came from, understands what their frequencies are, and off of that, bam, you get an image in your, in your mind. So I deal with the retina every day. And again, it's just a problem of labeling. It's all about labels. So this is normal retina here, and that's diseased retina. How's that different from the mango problem? Ripe mango, unripe mango, right? Ripe mango is yellow, unripe mango is green. Same thing. Now, not to, not to undermine or underestimate the importance of domain-specific knowledge, right? That's really, AI is necessarily a cottage industry, is what I say. Uh, AI is something that, uh, uh, Google's not going to be able to solve all the AI, no way, all right? Uh, AI is going to be solved by startups, small startups, people that are studying a problem, that have taken the time and the years to look at it and have the right interdisciplinary teams around them and are thinking about those particular problems. I understand what the nuances mean, I understand what the twists and turns mean and know how to fine tune the algorithm with situational and domain context specific relevance. That's how it's going to go forward. So it's like, it's a hard problem, it needs capital, but uh, that capital is really a spectral mix of financial capital and the human capital. And those things are very interconnected. Uh, and, but that's, a, that's another talk for another day. So um, I'll look at a picture like this. We have something that's called an OCT scanner, which is basically a sectional cut of the retina. You can look at it, it's an optical technique, it's like an x-ray without the radiation. You can look at that, and then if you take a sectional cut of this, we've got a problem. Houston, we've got a problem, all right? What's the problem here? There's fluid under the retina. There should never be fluid under the retina. These bumps are because of blood. This person can go blind, and they've got a certain number of time. It's an emergency. This could happen like that. And this happens in the U.S., the, the wealthiest country in the world. Every day, people are going blind because there's they're not enough retin retina doctors, okay, to take care of them. So you find something like that and you've got to move quickly, okay? You have to move quickly 
and you have to do a treatment on a patient. And this setup is something that, yeah, I, I take it for granted. This is my, this is my clinic, and um, we will do a surgical procedure, like an injection like this. I could do like 40 of these a day. I take it for granted, but I'll tell you that it's not that difficult to set up a retina clinic provided the capital is there. I assure you that one can set up a retina clinic anywhere in the world, say in Cape Town, for perhaps less than $200,000. And if you're really good, maybe, let, maybe uh, you can do it for $100,000. Um, in my country where I came from, somebody stole $2 billion, right? So with $2 billion, and they put it in a bank, they bought a yacht, they bought a, they bought a condo in New York, they don't live there, uh, they bought a couple of yachts, and then they took the rest and put it in a bank in Switzerland, that was the end of that. So with, just with that single person's heist, you could drop a thousand state-of-the-art retina clinics in Africa. And you can do that, I guarantee you, you can do it in six months. Because if you have the capital, I've got the cell phone number of the companies. I will give them a call. So yeah, it's the injection. We're about to do the injection. We um, we put a lid speculum in the eye and do this. And you take this for granted. You do this routinely. But this is the state of the art in terms of retina care. This itself is revolutionary. This first time this was in 2005. This became available. So I marked the eye 3.5 millimeters from the limbus, and then I'm going to put an injection in there and put a drug in there called ILEA. This is, not, we know how to do this, okay? Innovation means you're doing new stuff. If you're doing stuff that's already been done, it's not innovation. You just need capital and you need people that know how to do that. So we can set up a thousand redneck clinics in Africa this year, or by 2019, okay? We can do that and that's it. Um, so I saw this problem. It's a pattern recognition problem. I look at the scan of the retina, I know the treatment, I do that, and I kept doing, going, running back and forth, and I'll run back and forth like that all day. And one day I thought about it, I, I trained as a computer scientist, I'm a full stack AI engineer, I, I, I develop I, Android, iOS, I, I code in Keras, TensorFlow, et cetera, you name it, Java, JavaScript, all of that. And so I said, okay, I, I went ahead and started a company, because when you look at this, the, um, the hallmark of that fluid I showed you on the scan, these are all the diseases that it scans for. Diabetes, exudative macular degeneration, pseudophagic uh, CME, retinal vein occlusion, central serous retinopathy, uveitis, and macular retinal detachments. If we had an AI that can screen for all of that, that's a good thing, right? So we just went ahead and built exactly that. And so we have our app, and it's available on the Android or on the uh, Google Play Store. And you basically take a picture of a picture, and once you get that picture, it, it goes in the cloud, computes on our ML algorithm, and it comes back with an answer. Done. And my company was the first in the whole world to do that. What does that tell you? It tells you that if you can get that person's heist, right, and give it to me, we can drop a thousand retina clinics in Africa in 2019, and by 2020, Africa is the leader in eye care. And we brought AI in, we brought the clinical in, and we're done, okay? It's not that hard. So, um, so we're, we're testing this out. Uh, every every um, new technology needs to be scientifically tested. We have a multi-center uh, clinical trial that's going on primarily in the US by board certified ophthalmologists. Um, and uh, we're getting really good numbers, you know. We haven't even hit it with our big data science hammers yet. We just did a first pass algorithm. We're hitting 90%. Uh, and this is, mind you, taking a picture of a picture Phenomenal accuracy. So we're gonna hit we're gonna hit a hundred percent, you know, sometime in the very near future. I mean, the AI is just gonna be crushing it. It's real. I just showed it to you. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna bore you with how AI systems are built, but basically it's all about big data, right? You take data, you iterate, you learn uh, in your algorithms, and these things are called convolutional neural networks um, that we code up, and they're really some um, high-level languages like Keras that can do a lot of the groundwork for you. Uh, that's your convolutional layer there, uh, and you can uh, train really anything that you can label. And then cloud computing is a big deal because we hoist our trained algorithms into the cloud, and I was going to do a demo where it was going to go in the cloud and then come back with an answer. You can also do client-side stuff that runs on the actual device. You know, both are options, and they have pros and cons, depending on what you're looking to do. So as a reminder, 
Uh, it's an exciting time. The revolution has begun. All right. And that's the sound of it. It's a beautiful sound. And uh, it's an exciting time that we're living in. Okay. So I would like to thank my study investigators who are doing the validation study of the Daytrum trial. I'd like to thank my family. And I want to thank God for the phenomenal opportunities that we've had uh, to do this kind of work. That's my contact info. Uh, if you know anybody who, is high, who has a heist that large and you want to see Africa become the world's leading retina uh, center, eye care center in the world that's doing data science, integration, innovation, and is running circles around everybody else uh, by 2020, uh, give me a call. Uh, send me an email. Uh, we'll love to work with you. We're looking for investors, and uh, we're doing some exciting work. Uh, and thank you very much for coming. Questions? We're going to open up for questions now. Um, I think that was absolutely phenomenal. Thank and you. those of you who weren't looking during the, the video clip, I did tell you to get a drink, so that's <laughs> on you. Um, so I'll bring the mic around, and I think let's get started. Who's, who's going to go first? Hi, doctor. My name is Rumbi. Hi, Rumbi. Um, my first... Rumbi. <laughs> my first question is, how plausible is a digitized countrywide, continental, or global medical record system that would allow one to consult a medical professional or an IA, AIGP bot via WhatsApp without wasting precious time um, on medical history interviews or resources on travel? Um, so imagine you being able to use your retina scanner um, without moving and diagnosing patients um, across the world. Uh, then issuing encoded scripts and being able to refer them to their nearest specialist or pharmacy? That's an excellent question. You know, and that's sort of the model. Yeah, that is the model, you know, that we're going for. Um, currently, there are systems in place that are called telemedicine, where a picture is taken of the eye or a part of the body or, or data is collected somewhere or the other, and that's transmitted to a physician who's sitting behind a desk, reviews the information, types up their report and their recommendations, and then click send, and that goes back. Uh, what I just showed you uh, in our demo ran through the cloud automated and sent its recommendations automated. And so we're ready to plug right and play into that. And that, that is uh, a large part of the business model. Indeed, great question. Yeah. Thanks for that question. We've got someone in the back. Yeah, hello, my name is Remy Omoai. Hello, Mr. Omoai. I, I come from your country. Ah, yes, indeed. I see. Oh, sure. yeah, yeah. You, uh, you're talking about having money to establish those centers. Taking Nigeria scenario, yeah. let's assume you have the money. How do you deal with um, human power to work in those places? I mean, it goes beyond you just establishing those places. How do you now get people? Uh, is there a specialized training that can be done? Can it be interfaced into the educational syllabus? Yeah, great, excellent question. He wasn't going to let me get off easy. Is she going for question? Yeah, is she going? So it's a um, it, it, great question. Yes, absolutely. It's more than that's why I said it's a mix of financial and human capital. You know, and you were going to pin me down there. You didn't want me. You don't let me get away with that. That's exactly what I meant by that. That human capital is enormous. You know, money cannot buy everything, okay? Uh, the buck stops at certain places, but there are ways around that. You can establish accelerated training programs. One of the things that Africa has, which I mentioned earlier, is that it is the youngest continent on Earth, right? Median age, 19.7 years old. And there is a real hunger for uh, opportunity. I mean, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant people who are not able to go on and do what they need to do. You know, I was heartbroken when I heard the Minister of uh, Health uh, in Nigeria say that uh, trained physicians don't need to do medicine, that there's no room and they should go become uh, seamstresses and barbers and the like. And that was uh, really tragic news to me. Uh, instead, what, there's a huge shortage of care. So what we need is more doctors, not less doctors. And every doctor that's trained absolutely is a critical person so you can, in my field of ophthalmology, you can establish accelerated training programs and you can get people to expert level uh, based on the need that's in the country. One, one doesn't just copy a model blindly 
from the West, you look at what's on, my, on the ground, and then how do you get people to state-of-the-art level? I can do that. I, I can train somebody uh, in Nigeria who is finishing medical school and put them through a 36-month program and get them to be an expert retina specialist. Of course, more skills come with time, but to get the person to where they would be very confident, comfortable, and able to handle the job. You have the people, you have the resources. That's, that's what Africa has going for it, is really the numbers, the population. Thank you. Any other questions? Great question. We've got another one over here. Tell me, where do you think is the best place in Africa or in South Africa to learn more about uh, the data sciences and intelligences? Yeah, great question. There's a lot of uh, initiatives that are going on across the continent. I, I happen to be on the advisory board of two, um, two groups. One is called Data Science Nigeria, uh, and uh, Dr. Bayo Adekombi is the convener of that in Lagos, uh, Nigeria. And um, there's a lot of excitement. The bug has, people have been bitten by the AI bug, the data science bug. Uh, the skill level, we still need a lot of upskilling to get people to understand where they need to be at uh, in terms of, but there's a whole lot of people in Nigeria that want to become data scientists. Uh, there's a lot going on in, in uh, South Africa, uh, Cape Town, you know, Silicon, uh, Cape Valley of South Africa is the way uh, Cape Town is branding itself, and there's a lot of excitement there. There's a lot of work um, going on in Ghana. Uh, Google set up a center there. Nairobi, uh, Kenya, has a, a real um, uh, evolving tech scene. Uh, we've heard of M-Pesa and mobile money, and this is all stuff that came straight out of Kenya. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of, there's also the African International, um, African Institute of Mathematical Sciences. Uh, I was just there today at their graduation in uh, Musenberg. And um, they, what they do is get people who have graduate training in mathematics and get them into the industry. So there's really a beat, a drum beat of excitement uh, that's taken off. And we just need to, to focus ourselves on, here's exactly where you need to go. Uh, and, and we'll get there. So now, let's say you got uh, 10,000 people learning all those skills. Right. Now, um, to get it out to the rural areas of Africa, mm -hmm. you'll need a mobile device of some sort and you'll need a platform. Correct. Um, in your opinion, and I know you're not living in Africa anymore, but how are you going to get, especially those countries that are not like Kenya and Ghana that are already quite advanced in technology in South Africa, mm -hmm. some of the other less privileged countries, how are we going to reach deep into those people with a mobile device that they can afford? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. And I have, a, I have this slide here. And so what you see is, you know, this is Africa Com, right? Telcos, you know, and it's getting bigger and bigger. We're even going into 5G. So it's already looking really nicely connected. But still, as you pointed out, there are a lot of places that these arrows jump right over, right? So, yes, you know, there are places where even here in South Africa, you know, we, the, we, we can do better also with our access to the Internet. Certainly in Nigeria, Lagos, Nairobi, all these places, it's going to continue to improve. Uh, and so the penetration at this point is quite impressive. But, uh, yes, there's still going to be issues. Actual implementation and testing and adoption on the ground is going to be a lot of hard work. Uh, th that's, that's absolutely correct. But we'll get there. Lots of questions. I'm going to come over to this lady and then back to you. Um, hi, I'm Amanda. Um, hey, I Amanda. work for a tech recruitment company, and we find that there are quite a few data science graduates, or rather not graduates. They graduate from um, particular programs and don't have formal training. Um, and the aim of these um, programs is to enable those who aren't able to go to university and get these degrees so that they are able to get qualifications in their academies doing AI. Um, but then you find that um, a lot of companies are looking for a particular kind of skill set that comes with a degree when it comes to data science. Um, do you have any insights on kind of how to bridge that gap for those who have gone through that training and according to that academy would be worth their salt in a company, but companies just aren't looking for that kind of you know, self-taught, so to speak, um, uh, data scientist. Yeah. So um, from that perspective, as you know, I, I have the privilege of being a full stack AI engineer. And so I am an informed employer. And what I would tell those employers is that they're getting it wrong. Absolutely. Um, you, what you're looking for is skills. You know, um, you, I, I, talk, I, I talk about the degrees that I, for medicine, you need a degree. And I talk about having my degrees in math and computer science and so on. Uh, and really, when I, when, I, when I say those things, I'm really, in some ways, um, uh, talking to people who 
don't have the correct information and I'm speaking their language. But the truth is, from an employer standpoint, when I'm looking for people to hire, I, I have a job to do, right? And if you went to Harvard, that's nice. But if you can't do the job, I only have so much money and th this job needs to happen. So if it's not a charity, I'm not gonna hire the person from Harvard. I'm gonna hire the person who knows how to do the job, even if they didn't graduate from high school, because I, I only have this much money to spend. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what do you think is the likelihood of healthcare professionals being able to accept mobile money as payment rather than medical aid? Oh, it's gonna happen. I mean, mobile money is huge. You know, I'm, I'm good friends with uh, Dr. Bitengen Demo, and uh, Kenya has been really impressive. And I think Kenya is really leading the charge uh, in the technology space. Um, and so it's, I mean, they, they serve that up for us. You know, that's low-hanging fruit, and it's ready. Uh, it's, it's, it's an ideal mechanism, and I think we are only starting to see the tip of the iceberg in terms of what that technology is gonna do. It's gonna, it's gonna be in healthcare, it's gonna play a key role. These are all excellent questions, thank you. We've got another one over here. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Thank you, sir. Um, you took an example, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa. These are the most developed countries in Africa. Yes. Uh, if we go to Somalia, South Sudan, Central African Republic, you name it, all those, you know, uh, which, are, which have been in civil wars and which doesn't have uh, uh, healthcare in infrastructure. Uh, how will you start this uh, revolution of uh, uh, AI? Considering uh, less coverage, affordability, uh, handsets, which are not, uh, you know, uh, the standard ones, uh, the level of education. Uh, so how we can, you know, tackle this problem? Right. right. Yeah, it's, it's a more difficult problem in, in those areas um, where they don't have the infrastructure, the parts that these lines skip over. Um, but what you have in those places are people. So for there, what you're looking for is a more long-term, because I talked about that capital, right? There's a spectrum. Capital is human capital and financial capital, and it all blends into itself. And so uh, you have people there. I just came back from the uh, uh, African uh, Institute of Mathematical Sciences graduation today in Musenberg, uh, where I spoke briefly. And they call that the next Einstein Forum. That's the whole idea. They believe that the next Einstein is going to come from Africa, and that person is be, it could be in Somalia, you know, or South Sudan, uh, or or Niger. Uh, and so, initially, the, these mobile devices are very affordable. You know, the Android devices are very affordable. You can get care there, but I think education uh, and th those places certainly need more support. And I think that the more developed centers will play a role especially when it's recognized that you have a lot of potential in, the, in these areas and your next Einstein is probably in one of those places. Thank you. So we're quite uh, over time, but I think it's, it's very well justified. This has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Emma. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Odaibo. Um, a true polymath in our midst, I think, that's a very rare, rare thing to see. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming to speak to us. And if you would like to continue to speak to the doctor, you're going to be around? I will. I'll be, I'll be here the rest of today, and I'll be here parts of tomorrow as well.